I'm going to go through a bit of a summary about the workup for bone tumours and then go into benign bone tumours. Uh, this is a diagram from a, uh, I believe it was a uh, JBJS article from 1998 that looks at the um, how to progress through staging and management of bone tumours. Uh, so basically, we start with the patient's symptoms as we're, and then go through defining whether or not it's a benign or a malignant type of bone tumour or getting an idea about it and then proceeding from there with further investigation whether or not to do uh, a biopsy after that. Uh, so to start with clinical presentation, pretty straightforward. Um, patients may present to us with pain, uh, maybe from fracture or maybe from a biologically active lesion, uh, mass, deformity uh, and uh, often the incidental findings which they say are more likely to be the benign type lesions which makes sense. Uh, examination, again pretty straightforward, so looking at the lesion if there's a soft tissue mass uh, and uh, defining its characteristics and looking for any other sources a uh, uh, investigation is always important to look into excluding other types of other causes for a mass um, and looking at disease specific factors such as um, uh, sorry uh, prostate and uh, other types of sources for metastases Our basic uh, investigation is, of course, the X-ray, which um, which I'll go through. The features of an aggressive lesion include um, cortical destruction, periosteal reaction, and a uh, wide zone of transition. But there are a group of bone tumours that do show some um, more aggressive type features that are actually benign. The issues with X-ray is that we can't really get a 3D assessment. Um, there is uh, we can't really assess soft tissue uh, or the extent of the tumour around the uh, intramedullary and also um, uh, endosteal reactions. There are other options uh, to help us include the isotope, so technician scan, which um, as we know shows increased uptake at, uh, in areas of osteoblastic activity. Um, this is however affected by uh, areas of increased blood flow for other reasons and uh, some malignant uh, lesions aren't, uh, aren't, don't become hot on bone scan. CT gives us uh, increased visualisation of the co uh, cortex or of the bone to give us a better idea for surgical planning and uh, finally MRI gives us, uh, as we know, uh, more information on uh, the soft tissues and the Um, while uh, all these investigations uh, give us some information, it doesn't uh, give us a final diagnosis and any suggestion of a primary malignant tumour should at the end of the day be referred to the surgeon who will be in charge of the long term. Um, biopsy of the tumour, the basic, can be done closed or uh, by needle, so, or open, sorry. Um, and basic principles to take from it is that the tract should be able to be decided on block with the tumour wherever you decide to take the biopsy from. No additional compartments or neurovascular structures should be contaminated and uh, specimens taken from uh, a soft tissue mass rather than bone if it's available. And uh, to Distribute our op uh, options for operative intervention include uh, intralesional, so just within the tumour, uh, marginal within the reactive zone, wide, which is beyond the reactive zone through normal tissue but within the compartment, and radical, which is through normal tissue, um, extra compartmental. Uh, so the way in which to, uh, well, there's a few different ways to um, nine. So I'm just going to focus on benign bone tumours today and we'll progress through the rest over the next few weeks. Um, but uh, the way in which well, we can look at an X-ray and uh, try and develop a differential diagnosis is to look at the patient's age, how many lesions are present, where the lesion is in the bone, so um, not sure that, uh, the matrix, 
uh, what the lesion is doing to the bone and what's happening, what the bone is doing. So to start with age gives us a broad spectrum of uh, differential diagnoses. So uh, this is a, a good, I guess the majority of the benign bone tumours centred around the um, broad range you would say. How many lesions? So uh, multiple lesions are compared more commonly seen in benign cases such as fibrous dysplasia, non-ossifying fibroma, um, eosinophilic, eosinophilic granuloma, and uh, mitochondroma. And then um, there's also different options. The lesion should be looked at as to where it's sitting in terms of its uh, uh, position related to the cortex or the medulla and also where it is along the length of the bone, so it can persist or... So this is a good diagram showing it's a mix of benign and... Uh, uh, and showing how uh, they're more prominent in particular areas of the bone. So uh, which I'll go through. Um, um, and it's a good way to refer back to so that you know more from where it's sitting. For example, um, juxtacortical uh, benign bone tumours, you'd start thinking about osteoid osteoma, um, non ossifying fibroma, uh, ABC, or an osteoblastoma. In relation to the length of the bone, uh, so in the epiphysis we're more likely to see giant cell tumours, chondroblastomas, in contrast to the diaphysis, which is where we'd see the osteoid and the eosinophilic granuloma. The matrix can be defined as um, osteoid, which is calcified, or um, chondroid, which is a cartilage type lesion. And um, when you look around the lesion, you can see uh, the zone of transition from the lesion to the rest to normal bone. So a um, wide zone of transition suggests that there's uh, that um, whereas a narrow, well-defined margin suggests. Uh, what the bone is doing, so um, endoscopy are looking for periosteal reaction. Um, and uh, this is looking at different types of periosteal reactions which can be seen with benign bone tumours but they're generally a more solid type of uh, rather than a more aggressive lesion which uh, can have those like some uh, So I'll just go through some of the more common types of tumours there and how they fit into that classification that um, some of the common features. Uh, so I uh, divided them up into osteogenic, chondrogenic, fibrogenic and um, vascular. Uh, and then there's also some tumour-like conditions which we should all be aware of that may present as a... Uh, but um, with some other systemic... So osteoproducing, obviously there's a lot more than what I'm going to go through, but um, I just want to mention some of the more common ones. Uh, so osteoproducing benign bone tumours include osteoid osteoma and osteoblastoma. So um, the age, can you go see that? Um, so the age group commonly presents with is uh, 5 to 30 years, more, more in that, well they say the uh, mean age is, um, I think it was around 18, might be uh, the majority have more males than females. Um, uh, diagnosed with this with these tumours. The location of osteoid osteomas are uh, commonly in the proximal femur, the tibial uh, diaphysis, and sometimes in the spine. It's generally uh, seen within the medulla or within the cortex, and it's generally in the diaphysis or metaphysis more likely to be seen in the proximal end of the bone rather than distal. The matrix is osteoid, so 
um, calcified. And uh, the surrounding bone, there may be some reactive um, bone, but in the centre is a radiolucent nidus, which uh, is basically uh, an area of um, a fluidic area surrounded by reactive skin. Uh, the issue with osteoidosteomas is uh, growth disturbance and flexion contractures rather than um, malignant transformations. And uh, further investigations may include CT scanning, uh, and they're always bone scan positive. Histology, uh, so this is a picture here. Um, histology includes um, osteoid trabeculae with a uh, high degree of mineralisation in the centre. It's quite distinct from the surrounding bone, and they have um, the nidus, so that centre, is uh, woven bone surrounded by osteoblasts. Um, <clears throat> the treatment for osteoid osteomas include um, non-steroidals, which have been shown to uh, uh, otherwise um, ablation or, or removal. Um, there's a few different definitions that I've read. So um, that they say that the nidus is less than 1.5 centimetres in order to classify it as. But um, another place, I think it was Miller said two. Few so there's four main features. Oh, yes, I've written two. <laughs> so there's four main features of an osteoid osteoma. So it's sharp, round, or an oval lesion, less than two centimetres diameter, uh, homogeneous dead, dense centre, and one to two millimetres. Um, osteoblastoma uh, is seen in young adults commonly seen in the vertebrae or metastasis and diastasis of long bones again. Um, again, it's osteoid in matrix, but um, um, with a uh, radiolucent or uh, central calcium. And again, there may be a bit of reactive bone, uh, um, but in contrast to the osteoid osteoma, there is rare malignant transformation. There have been a few um, published Um, so treatment would include uh, biopsy to confirm the diagnosis after further investigation and can be done as intralesional or a margin. Um, histology uh, includes um, mineralised bone spicules and eosinophilic osteoid. Um, effectively the tumour cells differentiate into osteoblasts and mineralised. This is a picture. So these cells are the osteoblast type. So to contrast those last two, um, the way to tell the difference between the two, they say that um, pain is more persistent in the osteoid osteomas and uh, the size, as Lisa said, that there's a bit of a discrepancy between conditions, but effectively greater than two centimetres, you'd start to call it an osteoblast. Um, and there's slightly older age group in osteoblast. Chondrogenic lesions um, include a few that we see a fair bit. So chondromas um, include enchondromas and periosteal chondromas. Uh, periosteal chondromas seen on the surface of the bone, um, while enchondromas are within the medullary cavity and uh, commonly seen proximal humerus, proximal femur and the hand uh, seen in the diastasis and the metastasis. Chondroid uh, in their matrix, so a stippled um, type picture, and uh, sometimes have a bit of a uh, lytic features to them. Uh, they rarely transform to chondrosarcomas, and this um, certain long bone and chondromas have 1% risk. However, in Ollier's and Suchi syndrome, which I'll explain in a minute, um, there's a greater risk. Um, overall, the histology refers to lots of cartilage and, um, and chondrocytes, which is this picture. Uh, enchondromas are treated with observation, um, plus or minus further. Uh, 
um, when looking at an enchondroma, uh, features to um, to pick up on uh, include uh, a large um, lytic component with um, with the say bone scan activity greater than the ASIF, progressive destruction of the chondroid matrix, uh, an enlarging lesion, pain, or soft tissue mass. So coming back to those two conditions, Ollier's disease refers to uh, multiple endochondromatosis uh, and it has a 30% risk of, um, of progression to chondrosarcoma. Um, it's basically multiple endochondromas um, in all over. And there are other risks including fractures, angular deformity, leg length deformity and uh, Fuji syndrome is, refers to a condition in which there's uh, multiple enchondromas as well as angiomas, soft tissue angiomas, where it's, uh, there's a, up to 30% risk of transformation to chondrosarcoma, but um, there's also a risk of multiple other malignancies, so they say the overall tumour risk is uh, 100%. Um, so moving on from chondromas, uh, sorry, from uh, enchondromas, osteochondromas are thought to be the most common skeletal neoplasm seen in uh, age groups under 20 generally, often in the distal femur or proximal tibia, so focused around the knee, and um, produce sessile shaped lesions. Um, they say that, so there's a less than 1% risk of transformation with a solitary lesion, but in uh, osteochondroma with a cartilage cap more than two centimetres. Uh, multiple hereditary exostosis, however, um, uh, refers to an autosomal dominant condition in which there's multiple um, uh, chondromas which have a uh, increased risk of, of the um, individual malignant transformation. Uh, there it is there. So 5 to 28% of cases are shown to uh, with an overall lifetime risk of 2 to 4%. Um, these are some of the features of the um, malignant transformation of, of osteochondromas. I might just skip through a little bit. Uh, chondroblastoma, commonly seen in the uh, younger age group as well, so 10 to 18. This is located eccentrically in the epiphysis, um, but may extend into the metaphysis. It's an ovoid lytic lesion with a thin sclerotic margin, um, but well circumscribed. and uh, Overall um, treatment includes um, curatage and uh, intralesional exercise. Uh, chondroblastoma, one of the main differentials is a giant cell tumour. Um, uh, I've got a fair bit to go. Do you want me to... Sorry? Pardon? I can divide it, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, chondromyxoid fibromas are not very common, but um, uh, also in the chondroid group of benign bone tumours. Uh, and they refer to basically a mix of, um, the name comes from a mix of the uh, tissues involved in, on their microscopic appearance. Um, there's a picture of those. Uh, again, the treatment is excision or Fibrous lesions include um, metaphyseal fibrous defect or non-ossifying fibroma, which we've all seen a lot of, uh, and desmoplastic fibroma, which is a lot, uh, which is quite rare, um, but again a benign lesion that shows this osteolytic. Um, more seen in the femur and pelvis or the mandible. 